الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد ألهاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابر وقال تعالى ويل لكل همزة الذي جمع مالا وعدده يحسب أن ماله أخلده وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الاقتصاد في النفقة نصف المعيشة وقال تعالى وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم كاد الفقر أن يكون كفرا <coughs> My dear respected uh, brothers and sisters and our other guests here Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We're living in a very strange world especially in the time that we're living in and, and then in the West and then in London for many of us London, New York, Shanghai, Dubai that's kind of the trend now um, we seem to be we have two issues that we're dealing with uh, first it's the way the, the whole system works in which money I mean I'm not an expert in this and I'm sure Sheikh Yusuf is going to probably expound on that much more than uh, much more but uh, where everything travels up so the people on the ground uh, you and I uh, we're left uh, poorer and from a materialistic sense and the people at the top they make uh, every year they make the same amount and, and more they get their bonuses so if there's been extra claims in a particular year because there were these car scams of people having others bang into them and then uh, you know there was a massive scam two three years ago or five years ago and then insurance just shot up for everybody premiums at the end of the day the people at the top they're going to make the same amount of money because the next year they're just going to raise the premiums so we're going to end up paying the same, uh, you know, more and more each year, right? Because the people at the top, they need to get their profit and their additional bonuses and their raises and so on and so forth. Uh, like, that's like uh, with everything. I mean, we're, we're living in a system where we're so part of that system, which is prophesied by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well, that we could probably say, I was just uh, discussing with Sheikh uh, Yusuf earlier, that do you think we could say that we have, living in the West, we have actually become institutionally uh, materialized. Or you can say institutionally, we've become institu in institutionalized uh, in the mess of capitalism, uh, in, the, in the mess of materialism, in decadence, consumerism. We're all part of it. Because today the situation is that from the bottom end, as in terms of the consumer, there's a different problem. From the top, it's pure capitalism where they, they just want people to spend and spend and spend. They actually me measure the, we, we constantly hear in, in, in the news reports that uh, the, the health of a society, the health of this country is measured by how much people spent on Oxford Street, you know, during uh, this holiday or that holiday. And everybody gets really excited when people spent more. So despite the fact that you may not need, I lived in America for eight years and I felt consumerism was big there because you know, that's a land of opportunity and so on. There's still a marked difference, I believe, between the States and, and, and the US. So you know, what people are buying, 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 and then after every few months, they do a garage sale, right? You've seen the garage sales. And uh, basically, then they try to get rid of. And some people, they just keep it in there because they have these big houses, garages, and so on. I mean, we can't really do that in London. We have to be much more uh, careful about that. Uh, the problem we have, though, on another level, is that we will buy things, by the time we've actually paid it off, the thing is worn out. So you bought a new sofa or a new TV, and we're, we're paying, you know, we're paying every, every month. By the time we've actually paid it off, we, uh, it's all worn out. So you, you never really enjoy what you buy because you constantly think that you have to still pay it off, it's not really yours. And when you have paid it off, it's become old and you have to start again and you have to get the next best thing out there. So from the top down, it's just they, they, they want everybody to spend. And from the bottom up, 
the situation is, is different. The situation is that we are encouraged to spend as much as possible. And we've got some quite interesting things that, uh, you, you know, that, that, uh, that, that are used, uh, in a lot of promotions and so on. For example, if you just think of uh, some of the promotional material out there that we're bombarded with day in and day out, especially in London and you know, wherever else you are. I used to live in Santa Barbara in California for eight years. And one of the great things about Santa Barbara was that there were no billboards. Billboards were banned in the city. So I never saw a billboard for a very long time unless I went to Los Angeles, which is two hours away from that. But here we're constantly bombarded, you know, whether, you're, whether it's on the side of a bus or whether you know, it's, uh, you're waiting at a bus stop or, or on the road or wherever you are. So the whole concept of it is to get us to spend and to get us to indulge and to, to enjoy. So for example, it says, ice cream. Sheer indulgence. That's the motto. Sheer indulgence. Another one is pure decadence. Now these are all words that you know, we consider to be lowly terms for people who've lost their nafs and their soul and they've become uh, prey to their desire. But yet, this is what attracts us. Seeing that nice big magnum ice cream, right? And it says sheer decadence. Pure intelligent, indulgence, sheer bliss, and you feel like you want to go and get one. I mean, obviously, they spend millions uh, trying to find the right key terms and presenting them in the right way. I mean, that millions are spent in basically uh, producing these uh, promotions to make millions or billions on top of that. Another one is, it gets as far as saying, there's one that says, bring out the devil in you. That's so shaitani. It's like, bring out the shaitan in you. And we, we just pass by this. I don't think we even, I mean, w when you see such an advertisement, I don't think we even bother to think about it twice. Like, wow, that's shaitani. But shaitan is becoming so popular. Like, bring out the devil in you. That's the total opposite of what we're supposed to be doing. Another one is, Heineken refreshes the parts that others cannot reach. I mean, alhamdulillah, we don't, you know, most of us don't drink, but... It, it's just the term and it's, it's just what it's telling you. Another one is, just do it. I mean, everybody knows that one. What is just do it? Right, that's your night, just do it, right? And so just do it. It's just about bus freedom. Just do what you have to do, what you want to do. Another one is, when you got it, flaunt it. That's about ostentation, kibr, arrogance. But when you got it, just flaunt it. Some of the best ones, uh, advertisements are from Visa and American Express. One of them is, it's everything you want to be. It's everything you want to be. You, you see a person on the moon and when he needs money, there's an American Express machine there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a cash machine, a credit card machine. Subhanallah. <laughs> Another one is, have it your way. Just pure nafs, you know, have it your way, have it your way. Another one is, and this is a famous one, a diamond is forever. I mean, is it really forever? Right, a diamond is forever, and they've made literally billions out of that one. Right? Only Jannah is forever, or hellfire for that matter. Right? My goodness, my Guinness. And do you remember, I mean, those are uh, the older ones here will remember, happiness is a cigar called Hamlet. Do you remember that one? Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet. Do you remember that one? That, it was a British one. I don't know if you get Hamlet, yeah. Another one, betcha you can't eat just one. So just eat and eat and eat. Totally op opposed to what the Prophet ﷺ is telling us to do. So that's what we are bombarded with day in and day out. So what do we do? What this book is all about, it's actually, although it says the destitute, it's actually a very deceiving title in a sense because it's not just about poverty. It's not just about somebody who doesn't have 
material substance. But let me just read to you one portion of it, uh, one, one paragraph from it, which goes to explain what he's speaking about. And I'm sure our other respected scholars will expound on that further. He says, consider from the example of your own life that the agonies of poverty are nothing but the representations of confused souls when they abandon one another. So poverty is nothing but the representation of confused souls when they have abandoned one another. What is basically, uh, if 2.5% of the world's wealthy went to the poor, there would be no poverty in the world. But two point, even 2.5% 2 is not given. And this has been shown in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz within two, and, two years and four or five months of his rule, there was nobody in North Africa to accept zakat because everybody seemed to be well off. So today we're enjoying great prosperity. In fact, there's a hadith in Muslim which speaks about the Prophet was asked about different trials that are to beset the ummah. And then he said, then they said, what about after that? And then he said, after that will be the fitna to sarra. The fitna to sarra. The fitna of prosperity. Where the smoke of it will come from under your feet. Basically saying that it will be everywhere. Money will be very easy to have and to get and to gain, to use. And that's why today, poverty in Western countries is in a new... It's, it's got a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it has a new form. Because you don't have to have money to spend money today. You don't have to have money to spend money. You just have to have a few credit cards. And then you max them out and then you become bankrupt. And there's a system in place to deal with that. So people are buying on credit cards. And depression, etc., etc., you know, that's, that's besides the point. That's an after fact. The fact is that we need to indulge right now and just make and get as much as possible. So what he's saying here, though, is that the agonies of po poverty that people feel they come from nothing, uh, they're just a representation of confused souls when they abandon one another. Compassion is gone. Selfishness has set in. There's no, absolutely uh, no care and concern for, for anybody else. And I mean, sitting here and with what's going on in Syria and in other places, I mean, we do seem even hypocritical even speaking about this because of what we eat. Just today I saw a video of these two kids who are in their own world, they're, they're just picking literally from among the pebbles, they're picking bits of bread. The older sister who's 10 years old, and then you've got this younger brother of hers who's about seven. The younger brother, he's just finding the bread and eating it. And the 10-year-old, she's, she's discussing with the interviewer, but she's just going about her work and she's just saying like, you know, and she's piling it up on this cardboard piece, uh, on this cardboard piece of cardboard, literally, literally like what birds would pick. That's, what's, that's what they're reduced to. And he's saying that we've been left behind. But the Iman, mashallah, is so great that sometimes you, you sometimes think that do we need poverty to strengthen our faith? Is that what's going to help us? Because we become so institutionalized in capitalism here that we become part and parcel of the system where we don't even think otherwise. So then he says... And that is the simplest form of hatred. Then he says, or oh, when they conflict with one another, then that is the cause of hatred. <coughs> or when they plot against one another, then that is hatred itself. And then he says, it is for this reason that the miser, that the miser is one of the ingredients of poverty. Subhanallah, he has really been thinking about this. That the miser is an ingredient, he is contributing to the poverty of the world. Though he may account himself one of the many elements of wealth. So he thinks he's one of the elements of wealth. But he's actually one of the ingredients of poverty. So this book is going to challenge us. It's going to make us rethink. And I'm really glad that this has been translated. Because it's extremely profound. It will deal with wealth. And the concept of poverty in a way that you've never heard about it. We've never thought about it because we're so institutionalized. It, it, it will, it, what, it, what it seeks to argue here is that poverty is not just absence of wealth, but poverty is rather the absence of all 
uh, uh, praiseworthy character traits. That's poverty, which is more harmful than the poverty of wealth. Yes, there's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, كَادَ الْفَقْرُ أَنْ يَكُونَ كُفْرًا That it, it is very possible, it's likely, in many, many circumstances, situations, uh, poverty does lead to uh, infidelity. You know, somebody renouncing God because they think they've been, uh, you know, they think they've been forsaken. But that happens in very few cases. From a lot of what we've seen, subhanAllah, it strengthens Iman as well to a certain degree. But regardless of where you are, the worst thing is to be poor in terms of compassion, in terms of generosity, in terms of love for the other, in terms of preference, contentment with what we have, not hankering after everything that, that is out there that shines and glitters. That's really, that's really what we need, to be, uh, we need to be looking towards and to try to imbibe within ourselves. Now the fact is that regardless of where you live today, Regardless of where you live today, many countries, they've just followed the same path. This phenomenon of riba and etc., it's worldwide. Whether you're in a Muslim country or otherwise, it's just sometimes cloaked in different names and, and so on and so forth. Yes, there are some serious institutions uh, that are properly Islamic and so on, but there, there's definitely the same problem you'll have in Pakistan, you'll have in India, you'll have in the UK. So what is it that we need to do? So at the end of the day, we need to get back to ourselves. And we need to realize, and this book, inshallah, will be assisting in that regard because it will make us really think. And hopefully it will get us into the center. Because despite all that we have and the material that is available to us, we're in a very good position to do a lot. As long as we don't become institutionalized in that same greedy game. And that's what's most important. It's to think of it, to, make, to, 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 to repent from our excesses of the past and to focus on the future because God is always forgiving. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He likes those people who reflect because that's what He says in the Quran that people should do. Look around. We're so, we're so uh, tunnel visioned in, in, in terms of what's around us that we don't look around the world and how things are happening, the factors that are in play. So that's what we need to do. I'll give you one last story before I finish. But just a few observations. We live in a world where the dollar is one of the most uh, popular currencies. The dollar says on it, the dollar says, in God we trust. Yet, why don't you tell me how many minutes I've got left? Oh, I have eight more minutes. Yeah. I was going to finish off in two. Oh, so okay, you can finish in two okay. Like all right, <laughs> inshallah. So we live in a time where you've got one of the most popular currencies of the world, in God we trust, yet not a single God-ordained law or rule is observed or, even, or is even taken as guidance in generating that wealth and that money. So it's there, and that's such hypocrisy. In God we trust, yet everything is man-made. The whole system is man-made, and that's why it collapses. And yet the bill is there, I mean, subhanAllah. Another thing is, what Hassan Basri said, he said, money is the sort of companion. Now think about this deeply. This is one of those profound statements. Hassan Basri, one of the tabi'een of the, uh, the early century, he mentions that money is the sort of companion that will not benefit you unless it leaves you. It can only benefit you if it leaves you which means you spend it, and thus you get something out of it. You help another with it. You leave it for your, you leave it for your family. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said that your wealth is only that which you've spent. That which you leave at your deathbed, that becomes somebody else's. It transfers. Your wealth is only that which you spend. And you either spend it in indulgence or you spend it in investment. A worldly investment or an investment for the hereafter that will be accounted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a hadith that I'd like to finish with which gives us a lot of hope. The reason it gives us a lot of hope is that if we've had excesses of any nature, I mean it doesn't just speak to this issue, it speaks in general. And I find it provides a lot of hope because that's what I believe Islam is, a, is, is the deen and a religion of great hope. 
that regardless of how one has been and whatever one has been involved, involved in or indulgent in, and however many excess, uh, excesses a person has committed, there's always something, a way out. So Imam Tirmidhi relates from Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. He says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had mentioned this incident to us on so many occasions and then he counted about seven occasions he said probably even more than that that this incident was related to us by the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than seven times essentially what the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said was that there was a person whose name was kifl from among the israelites so this is a story of the past nations one of the israelites his name was kifl very a very uh, wealthy playboy. So he would indulge in whatever he wanted. I, I mention this today because, as I said today, the second generation of uh, Muslims who are here, in general, because we're in, the, uh, in, in this uh, phase of uh, fitna, uh, the, the fitna of prosperity, you know, the trial of prosperity, where we, have, we seem to have a lot of disposable income at our disposal. The first generation that came into this country they lived five to a room sometimes, sharing bathrooms and toilets and, and so on and so forth. That's our parents, the first generation. But today we're reaping the benefits of that. And this is where we have to be careful. Many of the first generation that came here from countries like India, Pakistan and Egypt, etc., they also had to look after parents back home. So they had to do those kind of things. We don't have to worry about that. Um, so you've got this playboy. And today is a time where we've got more playboys than ever before. You've got normal people who can indulge like rich people. I mean, I mean, how many of us can go into a supermarket and we have the whole world in front of us? And in the last 10 years, it's just exploded. When I went to America in 2000, my local Sainsbury's used to have, used to have two racks of drinks. The choice was a few dilutes and a few juices, and that's about it, literally. When I went to America and I went into our local Albertsons, right? It was two aisles of drinks. So I was going from two racks of drinks to two aisles full of all sorts of drinks. These big gallon punches and, uh, and all sorts. I was like, wow. When I came back in 2008, we had been transformed as well. And now today you go to your local Asda, whatever, you've got the same thing. You've got a whole aisle or two of just drinks. You've got aisles where they will be selling you Polish food, they'll be selling you Arabic food, Moroccan food, Egyptian food, uh, kosher food. Everything you want, it's there. Companies have to vie for space, and the product needs to work. That's why huge amounts are spent to provide all of these advertisements for decadence and so on and so forth. SubhanAllah. So there was this Playboy. That's my last one. There was this. <clears throat> he was, his name was Skiffel. Now, he, would, he, he had absolutely no concern for any form of sin, any form of wrong. He would do as he wished, and people knew him to be like that. In fact, he was so bad that people didn't want to know him. That's how bad he was. He just had lots of money, crazy playboy. So now, once he hired a woman for, uh, for uh, prostitution purposes, and you know how much he paid her? He paid her sitina dinaran. 60 dinar, 60 gold pieces. That, according to today's equation, would be several thousand pounds. Because 20 dinars, which is the quantum for zakat, is about 2,000 pounds right now. So if we were to give that equation, he paid a few thousand pounds. He paid a huge amount of money, whatever the equation was. <coughs> He's, it says that when he sat, at, when he sat to do the act, when they got right to the crux of it, she began to tremble and she began to weep. And he said to her, Ma yubkiki, what is making you cry today? Uh, 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 do, do, you, do, I, do you dislike me? Don't I look good? Like, what's your problem? He thought she was just like any other call girl that he had hired before. She said, no. This is something that I've never done before. This is something that I've never had to do before, the only thing that has forced me to do this is need, is poverty. That's what's forced me to do this. Something clicked in his mind on that day. 
He didn't care about anybody. He was a selfish brat. He didn't care about anything. But something clicked, on, something clicked for him that day. He said, You've never done this before, and today you're doing this. You know what? You go, and the money that I've given you is yours. So take the money and go. It's okay. Take the money and go. Wallahi la a'silaha abadan. And then he made a promise. He swore an oath that I will now never disobey God. It was just one of those moments. One of those moments. So she went away. At night time, he dies. Famata laylatahu. That night he dies. And everybody, nobody wants to touch him. They don't want to bury him because they just know he's so bad. He's, he's dirt. He's filth. Nobody wants to touch him. In the morning, everybody sees written on his door that قَدْ غَفَرَ لِلْ قَدْ غُفِرَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ غَفَرَ لِلْكِفْل That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven kifl. That's when they buried him. Sounds a bit mythical, but there's great hopes in there. And this is from the past nations. This is related by Imam Tirmidhi. He says, هَذَا حَدِيثٌ حَسَنٌ That this is a sound narration. But that gives us a lot of hope. That's an extreme example. But at the end of the day, we need to really rethink. And inshallah, this book will help us in that, in that regard. So I really thank uh, Sheikh Yusuf for number one, finding the book, chancing upon it, translating it, because it is a very complex book, even in Arabic. It's a maqamat. It's full of rhetorical techniques and so on. It's quite amazing. And then the English is, mashallah, at a very, uh, v very profound level as well. And then mashallah, Torah for, uh, you know, for the work that they've done on this book and all the other works. And if you do want to go down to, to meet Torath and see the head office, it's called U.S. Junction. On, I mean, I'm promoting you, so that should be fine. <laughs> U.S. Junction in Tooting. So, you know, you can go in, mashallah, have a cup of tea and get a signed copy from Yahya, inshallah. Mashallah, Yahya is a very unassuming man. I'm praising him in his face. And I know the amount of work he puts into this. He, he spends huge amounts of time, effort, money into producing these books. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him and make this a source of sadaqah jariyah for him and his family and his father uh, and his parents, inshallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all ajr for this. Wa akhiru da'wana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.